Libre. That's one of my favorite movies ever. I mean, that is like a classic from beginning to end. This is, the, we've decided to change the tone of this class to a film appreciation class for those of you just tuning in. So, yeah. <laughs> We are done. We're done. We're done with web development. You know, we, you, you guys know it all. The rest, Google it. All right. <laughs> we're just going to talk about our our favorite movies now. Um, by the way, for those of you that are on campus, our lab starts at um, noon. Apparently, between 11:30 and 1, there's free food somewhere. I think outside. So if you want to take a break before lab or whatever you can you can <laughs> yeah I have no idea I mean I would not expect gourmet fare but it's free you know we're in the business division here and we're good at doing cost benefit analysis where you compare the cost benefit so when the cost goes down to zero that graph kind of shoots up pretty quick uh, as far as the, the benefit anyhow we're here to wrap up the discussion of forms we have a few more things to talk about um, pretty much most of the stuff I've been talking about um, are, forms, uh, are, are forms tags related to HTML 4.01. So really haven't talked about anything specific HTML 5. Today I'm going to wrap up sort of the basic old form tags, talk about a couple tags used to group form items together, and then we'll look at some of the distinct HTML 5 uh, uh, tags. We left off on this, and again, our original form we used to submit to the Bing search engine. This form, we're not really submitting to anything. We're just, we're just creating the form elements, and we'll pretend that there's something to submit it to on the other end. All right? We see we have um, a text box, a drop-down, and a radio button. Radio buttons, again, are such that when you click on one, the other clicks off. Now, let's look at this. Let's look at the code for this um, to review real quick. I have my form with a method of get. Normally, there will be an action on the form to say the server-side script that you're submitting to, but in this example, there is no action. We're actually submitting back to itself, which, again, is actually done in many cases. All right. We talked about formatting a form and a good strategy is to use a un, uh, an unordered list where each form element is its own list item. We use a label tag both for accessibility and for styling purposes because if we look up at the style we put that having a text align of right and that makes for the nice little lining up whereas the there's sort of a I don't know what you'd call that sort of a middle margin here where both the mo, both the name and the text both the label and the, the form element kind of line up this way the label tag again is used for accessibility it helps people using a screen reader to associate um, the form element with the text of the label. The label tag points to the ID that's being used. All right, points to the ID being used. So, for example, this input tag has an ID of txt name. The label will say for, and you list the ID. One thing that's confusing uh, sometimes is the fact that form elements can and often will have. Um, names and IDs. The name is used um, is, is used to send the data to the server. In other words, that's what's going to be called. That's what this value is going to be called when it gets to the server. So the, if the server is expecting a certain name, that needs to be the name, not the ID. So the name is, is primarily used for uh, the server. Um, The ID is used typically with JavaScript. It's used with the labels. And it can be used for like styling purposes. An ID needs to be unique. A name doesn't have to be unique. 
In fact, with radio buttons, it won't be unique. If we notice, each one of these has a radio button of county. And that's what really makes them act like radio buttons. All right, the fact that they have a common name. If we were to give one a different name, it wouldn't act like a radio button. So, uh, like if we, if I put a letter A in front of that name, now that one has a different name. It won't really act like radio buttons then. So I can click on Lorraine and Erie. All right. Because these two act like a group because they have the same name. So having a common name is what makes radio buttons act like a group. The last thing we have is the submit button. And the submit button says go and send this data, everything between the start and end tag, uh, start and end form tag, uh, send all that to uh, the server. Just as an aside, when it gets to the server, the server has no idea if the data was in a text box or in a drop down or anything like that. The server just needs the data, right? It doesn't really care how the data was formatted. And that's actually kind of like a good thing, all right, um, for several different reasons, all right? It'll, it'll just come as it comes as a set of ordered pairs where there's a name of a field, equals, and value. And if you look on the query string, you could see that. All right. We talked about a couple of things that we weren't going to talk about. That is the clear button and the plain old button. Let's wrap up with some of the HTML4 things. One of them is a checkbox. A checkbox is typically used for a yes or no question. Agree to the terms you never read. One thing that I will often do, and I, I, I don't know if I encourage this kind of sloppiness or not, all right, but I'll tell you. But you didn't hear it from me. You heard it from Norod. He came in and told you that. Um, is sometimes, if I'm lazy, when I give the, the name and the ID, I give them the same thing. That way I don't like have to worry about like what I called what because they both have the same name and ID. The only one that that won't work for is a radio button because a radio button, they have to have the same name, but they have to have different IDs. But like for this one, I'm giving it an ID of terms and a name of terms. A lot of times I'll do that just because for either purpose then, I, I can remember it's called terms. It's just easy to remember. That being said, you should know what the name and ID, what purpose they achieve. Here we have a checkbox which can only be in one of two states. It's either checked or unchecked. One thing that you notice, I think I did this. I, oh, I left it the value as Lorraine. Let's put a value of Y. If the checkbox is checked, then the server will get whatever value is in the checkbox. So, for example, that says terms equals Y. So whatever value I put as an attribute there, that's what's going to get sent as a server, to the server. So you got to know what the server is expecting on the other end. Is it expecting a Y or an N? Is it expecting a true? Is it expecting, what is it expecting? Nothing is sent to the server if the checkbox is not checked.
Well, it... How would that be communicated? The question is, is, is how does a person writing the uh, client code for the form know what the server is expecting? One of two things. One of two situations. Or one of three situations. All right. First situation is um, that you're using someone else's script, like we did. In which case you reverse engineer it like we did with Bing, where you look at the query string and figure out what it needs to be called, or they would provide some documentation. So that is sort of an atypical situation. Usually, if you're talking about in a web application, you know your forms are submitting to your pages or, or your scripts. So in that case, one of two things: either you're the person developing both, or you're not the person developing both. You're developing just the form and someone else is doing the server-side script. In that case, if you're doing both, then you know, hey, I call it txt name, so my server-side script is going to be expecting it in a field called txt name. Um, if you're not, then you'd just have to communicate and you'd have to say, you know, the person could go a lot of different ways, but you just communicate and, and hash out between you. They could give you some documentation, or you could say, here's my form, it has these fields. It you know, doesn't really matter what they're called as long as they, they, they link up and, and what's called in one place is called in another. So, for example, um, I, I think I posted a form assignment where I've done, since I've written the server-side code, I've written what I've expected. Do keep in mind that the little table in that example doesn't mean that's what the form should look like. This is just a description of what should be in the form. All right. So like in that case, I said something like there will be, you know, there'll be a, ch you know, there should be something that indicates whether the person wants pepperoni on their pizza or not. And I said what the name of the field needs to be. Now you can actually implement that a, a few different ways. You can make a text box name that field. I'm not suggesting you do, but you could. You could make a radio button. You could use a checkbox. Or you could use a drop down. So you could actually implement that a bunch of different ways. And some of the ways we could probably argue one way or another are, are better or worse. And there's probably reasons to pick either of them. Some of the ways are probably clearly not a good idea, like using a text box to indicate that. Because the person will have to know exactly what they need to type in. For, for, uh, for that to work. So anyhow, typically either you're doing it or you talk to the person that's doing it and, and you develop uh, that. The next thing, yeah, sure. Right. Um, that is either done via client-side JavaScript validation or it could be done via server-side. The way you're describing typically is done on the client-side. Validation, we'll, we'll probably talk about validation when we talk about JavaScript uh, in the last couple of weeks of the class. Um, the advantage of JavaScript is it gives you an immediate response. So like if you forgot to put in your zip code, it can tell you that before it gets sent all the way through the internet and makes it to the busy web server and the busy web server looks at the data and says, hey, you forgot the zip code and then sends the message back. All right. Because the JavaScript is on your machine, it can give you an immediate response. All right. Truth be told, a lot of times the validation is done re redundantly. It will be done both on the client and the server just in case someone's trying to circumvent the um, client side validation. Either, either legitimately, i.e. they turned off JavaScript for whatever reason, or maliciously. Like, hmm, I wonder if I do this. Can I put in such and such? And is there server-side validation to catch that? So yeah, typically that will be done client-side, but oftentimes it will be done uh, redundantly, both client and server-side. Some validation can only take place on the server. All right. For example, let's say I had a entry field for credit card number on my page. My JavaScript could make sure that I entered something in that. It could make sure that I've entered in a numeric value, right? So I didn't just type in some garbage characters. It could make sure 
that I entered in something that looks like the right format. In other words, how does it go? Uh, MasterCard has 15 numbers, American Express has 16, or something like that. There's a certain number of, of characters associated with credit cards. I don't know if my numbers were right. Oh, they were? Good. Good. Um, it could validate that, but I couldn't validate, for example, that that wasn't a credit card that was reported stolen, or that that wasn't a credit card, or that was just, you know, one, 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 just a number that I made up that isn't a valid credit card. That requires a little more horsepower to do, and that kind of validation would have to happen on the server. So the client-side validation in JavaScript is sort of like someone glancing at the form and saying, yep, you entered everything in, whereas the server side would be someone actually looking at the values and saying, hey, that's legit or that's not legit. All right, next thing that we have is a text area. And a text area is a multiple line text area. And I did not want to put it there. Um, so this is like a multi-line text field. That's more like it. Whereas I can put in what I want. All right. I can actually control the height and width of this, the rows and columns, a couple different ways. I can actually put HTML attributes on it. I could also do it via CSS, which probably would be the better approach. But that only relates to the physical size of the text area. So I made that 200 by 200. I can type in as much as I want in there. Um, you would have to do JavaScript validation again if you wanted to make sure that a certain number of characters weren't exceeded. Um, you know, like depending on like what's on the other end. There might be a database on the other end that only accepts a certain number of characters, or like if you were using Twitter, it only accepts 140 characters. So like if you notice, like any of you that use Twitter as you're typing in your message, it gives you a countdown how many characters you have left. Um, that is done via client-side JavaScript. All right. Whereas every time you touch a key, it looks at the length of it. Oddly enough, the JavaScript for that is pretty straightforward. We might, we might play around with that um, when, we, when, we, uh, when we talk about JavaScript. But the idea is, is we can set the physical size, and that really doesn't have anything to do with like the logical size of it. So just because I constrain the width, I can type as much as I want to in there. Yeah. I'm in the CSS code. Question? Okay. Next thing we can do, and this is relevant both for appearance reasons and styling reasons and just logical reasons, and there are accessibility implications as well, is we can group our fields. 
all right? This is especially valuable if you have a big form and there's a lot of data in it, all right? If you're placing an order, for example, there might be a shipping address and a billing address, all right? And there's two discrete sections of the page. This section of the form is for shipping, this section is for billing. Or maybe you'll see like address information, billing information, and so on. So anytime you can sort of group your form into several little parts, you can use field sets to designate that. Now, this is a pretty tiny form, all right? So just for the purposes of the demonstration, I'm going to put these guys in one field set and the other one in a different field set. So, field set indicates the start. I'll do the first couple of fields in it. Sorry. I've just I just put a field set tag here before the fields here. And I'm changing it to each field set corresponds to one unordered list. So now if we look at it. There's like a border that goes around it by default. Of course, as you know, we can change any of the defaults that we want to um, through CSS. We could put spaces in between them. All right. Now, note that I haven't talked about specifically styling form elements. And the reason for that is styling form elements is just like styling anything else, right? If I, I mean, I want to set the font of a link. How do I set the font of an input tag? The same way. All right. So, there's nothing special about styling these form elements. Um, I can make the buttons different color the same way I would make a link a different color, all right, and so on. So I could go and I could give these a border if I wanted to. Um, let's go and just do a little bit of styling on this. Input. background yellow, color blue, font size 2M, 2M meaning again twice as big as normal, and field set I can say border Two pixel red dotted. A margin of 50 pixel and width 60%. Just kind of making things up. We'll see how it actually looks. Now notice the button and the text box are big old things. <laughs> the other things aren't. Why? Well, because those aren't input tags. So I could go and define for the select tag. And for the text area. And I, th and I think that's it. and so on. Now, also associated with 
a field set is a legend. So I can put in something that says what these fields mean, what this group of fields mean. So I can say legend. And let's just say this is um, mandatory information. And the other one is optional information. But what this does is this gives a little description of what the, these group of fields mean. So like shipping information, billing information, credit, credit card information. What do you mean? Can you style the legend? Yeah. Sure. Now again, what if we wanted those legends to look a little different? In other words, we didn't want those two legends to look the same. Maybe mandatory one look one green and and uh, I don't know optional yellow. Well, then we wouldn't style based on the HTML tag. We'd style based on a class or an ID or something like that. Likewise, if I wanted all the things in the one section, I again I could I could just give the class an ID. All right. Um, so, you know, even if I don't go over uh, a particular usage of CSS, you can still do it, you know. It's, you know, anything that we talked about for other stuff, you can do for the, this as well. Questions? HTML5 stuff. Let's go, and I think... I have a good browser and a bad browser. So this, this should be good. And again, there's no good or bad browsers, you know. There is simply browsers that support some things, browsers that do not support some things. All right, let's see. I did forget one other one, and that's if there's a password. This again is not specifically in HTML5. This is even in earlier versions of HTML. And the difference is that this will not get echoed. So as I type in the password, I get that. All right. Now on to some specific HTML things. All right, here they're repeating some of the standard ones. And then they have um, some things that are new in HTML, all right? New in HTML5, that is. Ah, here's a whole list of them. So, for example, there's now date.
telephone, URL, and so on. It doesn't show this as new because these are not new tags. It's still the input tag. It's new values of attributes, though. So, for example, I could put in, let's say, something for birthday. Now when I go in here, I get the browser's default little calendar guy that I can go and I can use the date picker to pick that. All right. Not going to actually put my birthday in here because we'd be scrolling a long time because it defaults to the current date. We only got about... Will the browsers, uh, recognize that? No. No. Not all browsers will recognize that. In fact, let's see what our friend Internet Explorer does with this. Treats it just like a text box. It still pat well, one second. It still passes it to the server, which is good, but it treats it as a text box. Yes. In this version of Internet Explorer, well, I'm going to give it like a real long answer here. Could you do something? Yes. It would take a lot of effort though. All right. Whereas this is simply a new feature of HTML that, that allows us to do it. And no. Shiv, shiv, shiv only, all the Shiv really does is it says treat these new HTML elements like block tags. Yeah. So, yeah, all that really does. So, to answer your question, you, we could probably come up with some JavaScript blah, blah, blah solution that would mimic this. All right? But that's exactly why it's a new feature in HTML. Because people have been custom crafting their own solutions to this and taking a lot of effort. And really, people that develop tools should take something that is done often and make it very easy to do. How many forms have dates on them? Well, a lot of forms have dates on them. So there should be an easy way to do it. All right? And the easy way to do it, they didn't get it the first time around, right? Okay. But they got it this time around. They says, okay, there'll be a date. All right? Now, here's the good news. Here's the good news. I can go and I can use these HTML5 tags like this. All right? And this is an example of what's called degrading gracefully. In other words, when I brought this up in Internet Explorer, um, in, a, in the earlier version of Internet Explorer, it didn't explode. It just acted like a text box. Well, guess what? What did we use for dates before there was this HTML5 date thing? We used a text box. So we're no worse off than we really were before. Right. You want to do some JavaScript validation. That's true. And again, there is some built-in validation in HTML5, but again, because of iffy browser support, you'd probably want to do that. All right. The idea is, again, how do I want to say this? As far as using HTML5 features, you want to be what's called, you know, the, the, in, a, in my mobile textbook, they talk about being future-friendly. All right. In other words, building with future possibilities in mind. So if I was doing this, I would use the date type, all right, knowing that, okay, worst case scenario, it acts like a text box. I might have to slap some validation in there, but 
I'm no worse off than what I did. And for the people that are using a browser that supports HTML5, which should be an increasing number every day, you know, as pe people go to the new Internet Explorer and, and more people switch to Chrome and Firefox and so on, then more and more people will get the benefit of that. So it's not too early to, this is one that I would say is fairly safe to use. Some of the other distinctly HTML5 characteristics might be a little riskier to use. You'd have to see how it, what the fallback situation was. But like in a case like this, um, it's really um, a no-lose situation because if you use a, a different input tag and that functionality isn't supported, uh, in a browser, it acts like a text box, which is what it was going to do anyhow. So really no worse off. I can key it in. Oh, that's cool. And even with this, I can put in a ridiculous date. I can, I can put... It looks like looks like I can put a five digit date, which means future web developers that will be the Y99999 bug in your web pages. All right. Just a heads up. Yeah, right. People laugh probably back in the old days. Yeah. I'm sure in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, right. Like, ho, ho, ho. That's yeah. That. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. Uh, let's look at some of the other things for this. There's range, um, except a telephone, except a time, a week, a color. Let's put color in just for giggles. Yeah, we can pick the color this way. All right. I don't know how this is going to work in. Yeah, this works as a text box. I guess you could you know, rely on people knowing the hex codes off the top of their heads to type in for that or whatever. Yep, exactly. Questions about any of this? Yes? That would be your action on the form. And you also would not use the get method. You would use, you'd use the post method. Other questions? Do I see a hand up? I thought I saw. Go back to the list of new. Some of these, to be frank, I, I haven't used, so. Yeah, it's, it's but, well, let's play around. Let's put range in real quick. Yeah. I'll bet you get two fields. Oh, 
Oh. Oh, look at that. Okay, it's, yeah, it's, it's a slider. That's right. I have seen that one before. I was thinking range like you put in a starting value and an ending value. Yeah. What you can do is you can use this to, to show, so like you could have 0 to 100 or something like that. So at that point you probably have to identify your... You'd identify, yeah, one of the attributes associated with it would be the step. the minimum and the maximum. Yeah. So you could say it goes from 0 to 100 increments of 0.5 or increments of 2 or whatever. And when you think about this, let's, let's just try to take a broader view for a second. You're getting, with HTML5, you're getting web pages that act more like what? Apps or applications. All right. So, for example, you know, if you were run, if you're running a, a uh, an app on your Android or iPhone, chances are you wouldn't have to type in a date. You'd click on it, boom, a calendar would pop up or, or something like that. The chances are there'd be a slider control for the touch screen and so on. So it's like not really coincidental that some of these changes sort of look like stuff that's in apps and for apps. Um, and what does that mean? Well, it means HTML5 and mobile devices is, is a good thing. In fact, there's even where, uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit about developing mobile sites in this class and, and the whole notion of progressive enhancement and that sort of thing. There's actually where you can take your HTML5 pages and using a tool called PhoneGap Build, you can actually build a application, all right, that, that you can run not as a web page, but as a app on a mobile device. An app. Yeah. Let's see, can I do this in five minutes or less? No, we're gonna we're gonna take we're gonna take this page, we're gonna make an app for it. Alright. This page I'm gonna take an app and I'm gonna install it on my phone. Alright? And we'll do it in five minutes. Someone start the timer. Uh, first thing I gotta do is I'm going into something called GitHub. What is GitHub? GitHub is a tool to manage repositories for open source software. I forgot how long it takes for this guy to fire up. I know it is. Alright. Alright, so. I'm going to go in and I'm going to create a new repository. And I'm going to call it 216. Click Create. There's my folder. I'm going to copy my page into it. Now the page has to be called index.html. All right. Go to GitHub. Go into this repository. I'm going to commit my changes. The first time, I'm going to send it up to the repository and commit. I'm now going to publish this to the GitHub server. I might have time to go for a cup of coffee. All right, so it is published. I now go to PhoneGap Build, not using Internet Explorer, I won't. 
I will now go to buildphonegap.com. I will sign in. I'll try my best to remember my user ID and password. I remembered my user ID and password. <laughs> Click to create a new app. What repository do I want to use? 216. Is thinking about it, it's doing this, that, and the other. I think there's a little hesitation here because it should be, yeah, showing that. Ready to build. It's compiling my Android application right now. It's also compiling an iOS application, which it's not able to do because I don't have an Apple license. Because I don't have any money, and those cost like, like a few, uh, hundred, I think. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, compiling a Windows phone for that one person that has a Windows phone. It's nice. Some HP thing, some other thing, and the Android is doing. I'm firing up my QR reader. QR reader is, is a piece of software that reads this little thing. I'll go and point my phone at it. My phone knows that that corresponds to a website. And I'm installing it, and I'm opening it. Yeah. And oh, looky there. If that isn't my application in five minutes, thank you. That's actually very close to that. 33 seconds. Yeah, oh man. All right. So, the point is, is HTML5 and mobile, like, is a good connection between those two. All right. And you can do things like this. Now, what's the advantage of this? Even if you have a great mobile website, you still got to have an app, right? So, this sort of leverages your HTML5 skills into creating apps. Now, you might say, what about integrating with the camera and all that? Believe it or not, there's actually libraries that will allow me to, through my HTML code, access an Android camera and blah, 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 whatever. So, so again, you can, you can access some of the native things on the device as well. So, again, HTML5 is, is great for those reasons. goes very well as far as mobile web development and even, in some cases, mobile application development. All right. That's all we have. See you in lab. Go get some free food if you want. <laughs>